um, has the department of it, the department uh, weigh in on it. Um, it's really important that we have these conversations, and I'm glad that everybody is here dedicating their time to it. It's very challenging conversation um, because of all the, the the balance that needs to take place. Um, I know the next guest will talk a little bit more about how um, the agencies are aligned on this and working through um, to make sure that we are we are finding that balance. Um, so I'm going to be able to stick around for uh, for part of the session, not all of it today, but I am just uh, very um, pleased that uh, that we are uh, having the conversation and that we're dedicating part of it during National Agriculture Week. Uh, thank you, Chelsea, and I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Holbert. And um, I don't know, is Katie on yet? I haven't seen her come on. I'm here. Ah, you're here. Okay. <laughs> Great All to right. be with you. Give me just one sec and we will give you a formal introduction here. Um, my apologies. We have been experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, all right, so next we are joined by somebody that I have had the honor of getting to know over the past year, Commissioner Katie Dykes from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Before becoming the Connecticut Deep Commissioner, Katie served as the chair of the Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, PURA, and as a deputy commissioner for energy at Connecticut Deep. Katie has also served as the chair of the board of directors of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And in 2012, Katie served as a deputy general counsel for the White House Council on Environmental Quality and as a legal advisor to the general counsel for the US Department of Energy. She is also a graduate of Yale College and the Yale Law School. Welcome Commissioner Dykes and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Chelsea. It's great to be with everyone and especially um, uh, to hear uh, the comments from my colleague, Commissioner Herbert, on you know it's just all these positive practices that uh, the Department of Agriculture is helping to spearhead to help minimize conflicts between um, our decarbonization policies, the economic development opportunities associated with cellular development, as well as um, the critical importance to protect um, our farms and our agricultural uh, resources here in the state. Uh, this is not an easy task. Um, these are, you know, uh, just it's important to be really upfront about that, that sometimes we can see that these uh, where these policies can come into conflict, but that's why um, we're working. You know, I'm so grateful um, to to you for pulling us together into this conversation today uh, because we have to get this right. We want to get this right, and we have learned a lot over the last couple of years. I can say, um, uh, you know, uh, about how to um, optimize and, and incorporate some best practices. We have a lot more to do, um, a lot more opportunity to improve on in ways that can minimize these conflicts and it's through conversations like these, uh, the one that we're having today that we can uh, listen and, and share um, lessons learned and hear from folks um, directly about how we can make these programs work better uh, to achieve our collective um, goals. So just real briefly, uh, I think you you covered it even better than I could, Chelsea, but obviously we have an urgent need to um, scale up the deployment of renewable resources as a way to achieve a more affordable, clean, and reliable energy future for the ratepayers of Connecticut. We need to address a, um, or achieve a reduction of 45% in our greenhouse gas emissions um, by 2035 economy-wide and 80% by 2050 um, in order to keep on track to reduce emissions um, at the pace that scientists are telling us is necessary to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And you know, as we reflect on why we're doing this, um, it's you know our national working lands are are um, are critical uh, as carbon sinks and as major employers and um, helping to provide for food food security here in our state. Um, and you know the changes that we're going to see in terms of climate change are going to have a direct impact on farm on farms um, across the state. So it's really important for us to reduce emissions as quickly. Um, and as affordably um, as we can to help uh, uh, minimize those climate impacts 
um, on farms and on uh, natural working lands across the state. We recognize a deep the complexity of siting renewable energy facilities and the need for a holistic planning approach um, and balance not only to protect um, farmlands but also core forests um, to protect water quality and water quantity and air quality. We look at this all holistically. It's one of the benefits of having um, a Department of Energy and Environmental Protection is that we um, are looking, we have the benefit of, of that shared and that holistic mission um, within DEEP and also working in partnership with the Department of Agriculture um, to try to pursue our climate mitigation and adaptation strategies um, in a way that also accounts for uh, the need for sustainability and addressing um, the protection of valuable natural resources across our state. So one of the things I just want people to be aware of, some of the things that we've been doing over the last year or two, um, that if you aren't aware of it, I wanna make sure that you know about it. Number one, um, to aid developers in understanding and, and, um, and, and farmers in, in understanding and, and navigating the siting and permitting process for solar projects, um, we've launched a concierge service at DEEP. So um, this is something very new. It's, a, it's an office that we've created within the commissioner's office um, to give folks um, improved service outcomes when they are uh, working through um, the permitting uh, uh, process. Whether you are um, someone who is you know, developing a solar facility on your land and you need to know about uh, our endangered species and threatened species requirements under NDDB, or whether you need to navigate the construction stormwater process or whether you're a stakeholder interested in learning more about projects, the concierge process provides for kind of a one-stop shop for people to navigate. We have over 125 different permitting processes that we're responsible for for DEEP. And so we wanted to make sure that this process is, a, there's an easy front door for folks to be able to get the help they need to participate um, and uh, to understand what these processes are. Other things that are important for folks to know is that um, we're trying to minimize conflicts as much as possible in part by in, um, prioritizing development of solar on uh, previously disturbed lands like brownfields and landfills. And in the special session last year, we advanced landmark legislation that is going to um, really improve and streamline the process for cleaning up contaminated sites, um, former industrial sites that uh, have been um, kind of trapped in a, a, uh, a program under the, tra uh, the Transfer Act uh, for many years that has just been really thwarting opportunities to redevelop those contaminated properties. So we hope that that will again um, help to alleviate some of the pressures of renewable development on core forests and prime farmland. We're seeing a significant increase in the number of developers who are interested in siting on brownfields, which is a positive. We're also updating our programs um, to better prioritize in the procurement process for renewables, um, the, uh, the emphasis and the prioritization on siting solar on previously disturbed lands. Um, DEEP has developed and, and strongly recommends using the forest land habitat map as a site selection screening tool for developers to avoid siting solar on solar facilities in forested areas. That's something that's gotten a lot of attention after the passage of uh, um, uh, Section 16A-3K, which discourages solar siting in core forests. We also have developed a forest habitat impact map core forest screening tool um, available on GIS. And that's helping again to steer solar development away from uh, core forest locations. So that's that's a positive. But we know that we have more um, uh, progress that we need to make in deploying renewable resources and other resources um, in order to meet our uh, decarbonization goals. There's so much more to say about um, what we're doing there, but uh, we, we are eager to kick off a, a, a stakeholder engagement process. It was called for under our integrated resource plan uh, to establish best practices for siting and permitting that will incorporate the feedback from developers, from um, the uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, from our, our, um, our colleagues and, and uh, uh, support, you know, and, and folks in, in the farm communities um, from environmental and environment, env environmental justice advocates, uh, from landowners, interested legislators, other stakeholders. Um, we're eager to uh, kick off a, a stakeholder process that will help make sure that our, 
our entire sort of renewable policy is informed and up to date with best practice for how to minimize these conflicts. And I know we'll, um, Chelsea uh, will we'll have uh, great opportunities and collaboration with the American Farmland Trust um, to help us steer that process. So we're looking forward to that. We'll, we'll be excited to share the kickoff when that gets started. But uh, thanks so much for having this conversation today and eager to listen and learn. Thank you so much, Commissioner Dykes. And I think you uh, set me up in a good place to go over the next part of our, or the next part of today's agenda, which is to discuss um, the current siting process in Connecticut so we can get, we can all get on the same page. And my colleague, Emran, put together this nice uh, flow chart. So, like I said, before we get started on best practices, um, we have this flow chart that as you can see from the flow chart, not every solar project in Connecticut goes through the same process before construction can move forward. For time's sake, I will give a brief overview of the process, encourage anyone who wants more detail to visit DEEP's website. I think Commissioner, Hurl, or Commissioner Dykes also just gave a, a good review of uh, some of the, the uh, process. So I'll try to keep this brief so that we can get right to Emily. Um, all right, so the first step is to determine the size of the array. If the array is considered a small project, it will be under one megawatt. Those projects are not subject to review by the Connecticut Siting Council. However, they may be subject to inland wetlands regulations, federal wetlands regulations, stormwater permits, natural diversity database review, and local zoning and land use permits, depending on the municipality. If a project is between one and two megawatts, a project proposal must be sent to the Connecticut Siting Council for consideration. And depending on where the proposed project will be cited, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection may require additional environmental permits and review. If you have a project proposal in mind, like Commissioner Dykes just mentioned, uh, DEEP does offer a concierge service and pre-application assistance to help determine what additional environmental permits requirements may be needed to approve your project. Uh, let's say your project proposal is over two megawatts, but under 65 megawatts, DEEP may select your project as part of their competitive bid process. If DEEP selects your proposal, you are required to sign up a, a power purchase agreement or PPA with a utility. Next, Pura will need to review your proposal. Uh, while the flow chart makes this process seem linear, at any point, your project may be sent to the Connecticut Siting Council for approval. If your proposal impacts prime and important farmland as categorized by USDA, NRCS, or core forests, your proposal will be sent to DOAG and or DEEP for an advisory opinion, as Commissioner Herbert mentioned, on the material effects your proposal will have on Connecticut's working lands. The Connecticut Council on Environmental Quality may also provide comments on the impact of the project. Uh, projects over 65 megawatts can proceed directly to the Connecticut Siting Council for review. The Connecticut Siting Council will take into consideration the advisory opinion of DEEP and DOAG commissioners and CEQ comments before they approve, reject, ask for modifications or conditions on your project. If given the green light by all agencies outlined and you have all the proper permits, your project has been approved and you can start construction on your project. All right, so before we move to Emily, one last thing I wanna highlight is that the legislature passed PA 17218 in 2017 that requires proposals over two megawatts but under 65 megawatts be reviewed for their substantial adverse environmental effects on prime and important farmland or core forests. Neither this review or the earlier one I mentioned, however, gives DOAG or DEEP commissioners approval authority over projects. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Emily, to discuss new ways we can approach solar siting on farmland in Connecticut. Emily, take it away. Thank you, Chelsea. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thanks for handing the reins over to me, Chelsea. Um, before I dive into some of the specifics around dual use solar, I'd like to take a moment and provide a little bit of background around AFT's work in this arena. Um, American Farmland Trust has been working at the intersection of agriculture and environment since our founding in 1980. And we really take a holistic approach um, to protecting farmland. We look at it um, from protecting the land itself, 
promoting best practices, environmentally sound farming practices, and then we're also ensuring that we can support the farmers and help them stay on that land. Um, there is a place for dual use solar to help in all three of those when it's done well. And so AFT has joined this conversation to advocate for those best practices. Um, as we know, and as we're seeing all around us, the expansion of clean energy is exploding. And it does create opportunities for landowners um, and for farmers, but it poses a real threat to farmland. Um, and this pressure, this competition for land, um, you know, it does increase the conflict over siting, which can cause delays. Uh, it can pit protection against renewable energy, uh, and when both really can, can move forward together for common goals. Research around energy in New England, including Connecticut, has shown that there's a significant need for clean energy, and a lot of that will need to come from solar. Um, but it also shows that just citing it on our built environment and on um, you know, least conflict or uh, contaminated lands will not be enough. Um, although there may be a technical capacity, um, there's not a feasible capacity due to costs, um, structural issues. Uh, so we will need to think about siting on green fields um, and how to do that in such a way where we can protect our land, protect our best lands, but also meet clean energy goals. Dual use projects where solar energy and farming continue simultaneously is one way that we think we can work towards those goals. Next slide, please. Uh, there are several guiding principles that help support smart solar siting that the AFT follows, and especially when it comes to farmland. The first is to protect the farmland. Um, prioritize smart solar siting on disturbed lands when you can. Um, make sure you're evaluating the built environment and, and work to minimize the pressure or the need for farmland. Um, next, prioritize the agriculture. When solar is being considered for a farmland site, designing the array as dual use can protect the farmland, it can maintain production, um, and it can protect access to farmland for farmers at least. And lastly, uh, it's to make sure you're prioritizing the farmers. When you're going to have solar on farmland that's going to continue in production, farmers really need to be a part of the design and the development. They know what's going to work for their equipment and they know what's going to work for their land. And so prioritizing farmers needs to be a part of this process as well. Next slide, please. So let's dive into what is dual use. Uh, you may also hear it called agrivoltaics or co-location. Um, and we're gonna to speak today around dual use in terms of farmland and agriculture. Um, you can also uh, perhaps hear the term when we think of solar carports um, as a dual use. But in terms of uh, farming and agriculture, it is installing solar voltaic, photovoltaic panels on farmland in such a way that the primary agricultural activity is maintained simultaneously on that farmland. You can see on the left, uh, there is lettuce under one dual use project. And then to the right of that, there's wheat. Um, I read something recently that uh, said, if we put all of our outdoor lettuce production underneath dual use solar, and it does respond really well, it appreciates the shade, we could increase our clean energy production by 40% um, just on the areas that we grow lettuce. So there is capacity here um, to do both well. Next, please. And so what makes dual use different from traditional ground mount? Um, well, it's the design, it's the construction methods, and then it's really about the compatibility of that with agriculture. Um, if you look briefly at the image on the top left, this shows two separate hectares, two separate fields, one with just ag production and one with just solar each at 100% ag and 100% solar. When you combine those two fields and put both agriculture and solar, you may not get 100% solar per acre and you, you won't get 100% agriculture per acre, but together you get more than 100%. Um, if you get 80% of the wheat production and 80% of the solar electricity in both of those fields, the efficiency has gone from 100% to 160%. 
And so there is a give and take here in terms of production, both in energy and in agriculture, but together we can see that there is an added benefit. Next slide, please. So uh, let's talk a little bit about design. What you can see in all three of these images is that the panels uh, are raised. Uh, that is different than traditional ground mount where they may be just a couple of feet um, off the ground. And this is essential for dual use because there may be larger animals. There may be um, uh, access of equipment that needs to happen. Um, and there may be sort of future changes that we need to account for. So I'll talk a little bit more around compatibility. Um, next slide, please. So what you see is uh, in this picture is the Sunbug Solar Array in Munson, Massachusetts. Um, this is the first one to, to go online. And you can see that the panels are raised. Uh, typically it's eight to 10 feet, depending on the exact type of, of panel and tracking system. Um, and the row spacing here is 20 feet. So this is also increased spacing between um, the rows. This allows for more sunlight to get around the panels as well as the spacing and height required for equipment. Um, this particular project also has bifacial panels and that allows some of the sunlight that uh, hits the ground and the plants to reflect back up and be used on the, the other side of the solar panel um, to generate electricity and increase efficiency. Next slide, please. Uh, construction. So construction also really differs. What you can see on the, the top here in the red international no sign is that there is a significant amount of soil disruption and disturbance happening on the, the top right. Uh, in the center, what, what you can see under those panels, um, just perhaps a little bit are concrete footings. So those are very common with typical ground mount construction. However, with dual use uh, um, construction, we're really trying to minimize the impacts to the soil and to the field. And so what you see on the left is much smaller machinery that is putting in a helical post that requires no concrete footing. And on below, what you see are driven posts. Um, and you can see that the ground cover and the soil is minimally disturbed in the bottom left picture. Next one, please, Chelsea. Uh, so other things around construction that would be particularly um, different and uh, important for dual use construction include maintaining all of the topsoil on site, maintaining ground cover um, and avoid grading where, wherever possible. Um, we don't need a perfectly flat field to farm. We don't need a perfectly flat field to um, introduce solar energy. Structural supports are the driven piles or the helical post, as I uh, illustrated in the slide before. And then again, if there are construction impacts, uh, it is something that needs to be remediated prior to the completion of construction so that uh, agriculture can move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and last piece here is compatibility. This really brings design and construction together with some foresight and some long-term planning. Um, you really wanna make sure that dual use arrays are designed to maximize flexibility because agricultural production is bound to change. And so when you have a low, uh, more standard ground mount array, that's less flexible for changing any future production. So if you have sheep grazing, which you know is is wonderful for added to a ground mount uh, array, it's if that is no longer the plan, it's difficult to then try to uh, incorporate other types of agriculture into some of those lower, more compact array designs. Um, and this is where cooperation with the farmer is really important to think about what might happen in the future. 20, 25 years is a really long time for a solar um, uh, lease. And so agriculture is bound to change. Next one, please. Something else that I, I wanna put out there, um, and this is about maximizing the benefits of solar on farmland. So what you see here is another type of array raised very high Pardon me one second.
the light show happening behind me. Um, so what you can see here is a, another raised array. And there are um, several things that you can think about when developing dual use projects that can actually maximize the benefit. Um, regenerative practice adoption, you know, improving the land's potential for carbon sequestration through soil health practices, improving the moisture retention in times of drought because of that, reducing heat stress in livestock because of the added shade. And so it's not only about what does the solar look like, but is how can we support better agriculture? And this is a great opportunity to do that um, because you're gonna have to adjust your farm plan. Uh, the farmer is likely to be able to uh, consider adjustments and adopting new practices because of the more stable and diversified income that they can get from leasing their land. Another uh, aspect is more ecological and landscape level planning. Integrating wildlife mobility and migration into the design. Um, in the Southwest, desert tortoises are of concern. And so I'll, there's an image later on that actually shows they have little doorways at the bottom of the fences to allow passage of these turtles to access land that they need to for feed. Um, you can increase the wildlife habitat um, with the use of things like native pollinator plantings. Um, and you can increase the site biodiversity because you have microclimates, you have areas of more shade and areas of more sunlight. And lastly, this is an opportunity to restore regions that have been environmentally degraded, um, improving desertified soil. Uh, it could be improving uh, sheet or rail erosion on farmland because they're in the construction process is an opportunity to make improvements to the land. And so maybe there's an impacted waterway nearby that could actually, um, that is being impacted by this particular field and that could be remedied uh, and rectified during the construction process. It's an opportunity to take advantage of improving many environmental benefits during this uh, siting process. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also maximize the benefits for the land and the farmers themselves. So protecting farmland from permanent development is essential. Um, Homes and, and buildings are permanent development. We will never get that land back. Well constructed and designed to dual use solar um, can be easily removed compared to uh, more traditional ground mount where there's a lot of uh, concrete or gravel potentially used. These are posts that need to be pulled out um, and the land can pretty quickly return back to agricultural production uh, upon decommissioning. This also protects access to land for farmers who lease and are willing to adapt to the sort of new type of farming that will have to happen around the solar panels. Um, but it's also an opportunity to maintain access for new farmers. And we know in uh, New England and Connecticut, especially access to, to farmland um, is a challenge uh, for new and uh, leasing farmland, or excuse me, leasing farmers, and it's expensive. So this is an opportunity to try to maintain some of that access. Um, for the farmer themselves, this is income diversification and this is some income stability. And so it's a way to, to improve tenure on the land. Next piece. Um, so that is what is dual use. Um, and there's often questions about, well, what about X, Y, and Z? Are these dual use? And so I wanna just illustrate a few things that AFT doesn't classify as dual use, we think that these are wonderful improvements upon ground mount solar. Um, but the, the grazing of livestock sheep as a partnership between a, you know, a shepherd, a livestock farmer and the, um, the developer, the owner of the array is a wonderful relationship to have and an excellent way to maintain the vegetation and also have a really nice healthy forage source for your livestock. But again, we don't consider that dual use because that, that it's difficult to do anything else on that site. It wasn't built and designed specifically um, with agriculture in mind. The other one is pollinator plantings. This is, it provides an amazing ecological benefit to the surrounding areas and to native wildlife. Um, but again, this is something that we think all ground mount solar should do. Um, it's a best management practice, but it does not make this a dual use array. Uh, next one, please, Chelsea. Oh, so here I just wanted to show you, this is the desert tortoise. These are their little uh, doors that they've created uh, in the Southwest to allow passage of these animals through. You know, small uh, 
changes to the design, but incredible habitat support um, and, and wildlife support in here. So again, you know, improving on all ground mount solar is, is possible with some of the same best management practices that we think about with dual use. Include smart solar siting, uh, utilizing design, uh, construction, BMPs, thinking about this at the landscape level and the ecological level, um, and really trying to maximize benefits. Next. Okay, so I just want to take a couple of minutes and uh, just share with you what Massachusetts is doing, our, our neighbors to the north, I'm here in Simsbury, um, and uh, share with some of the BMPs and some of the requirements that they currently have in place. And so uh, as part of the SMART program, uh, it is required that the design and the farm plan that goes with design do the following things. Not interfere with continued use of the land, um, it's designed to optimize the balance between ag and solar. It's a raised structure that allows labor and machinery through. Uh, crops, uh, the crop plan or the farm plan is reviewed by UMass Agricultural and Clean Energy Extension for compatibility and must be approved. Um, and there's annual reporting on the productivity, on the herd, herd size growth, et cetera, um, on what is happening in terms of the agricultural production to ensure that production is continuing. Um, panel height has to be eight feet for fixed arrays, 10 feet for tracking arrays that move, and no single square foot of the area can be shaded more than 50%. Next, please. Yes. So here are some of the construction standards in the SMART program. Uh, no removal of field soils whatsoever. If it's uh, temporarily shifted, it must be put back, but it cannot leave the site. Um, you can, um, when required, do some very limited disturbance and leveling if needed, but ultimately trying to leave it as undisturbed as possible. Um, you have to use the sprue type or the post-driven pilings, um, some other uh, proposed acceptable form of minimally impactful structure. Uh, when you're trenching for electrical, you have to move soils temporarily. You must put them back. Uh, no concrete or as asphalt in the mounting area and only where it's required in terms of transformer or battery storage areas. Uh, any existing soil or water resource concerns have to be addressed um, to avoid any negative impact to soil and water BMPs. Uh, there has to be limited use of any sort of geotextile fabrics and you have to maintain vegetative cover to prevent soil erosion. And this is um, during the construction process. And that's where a lot of soil loss can happen. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to mention quickly what's happening in Maine. Uh, so in 2019, they um, passed the act to promote solar energy projects and distributed generation resources in Maine. Um, and this basically opened up um, a lot of uh, projects and community solar um, design, or excuse me, community solar projects across the area. There isn't any specific dual use uh, regulations or guidelines. Um, there's no incentive like there is in the Mass Smart program, I should have mentioned, for dual use projects at Mass Smart. They get an extra six cents per kilowatt hour, and that's because of the design um, aspects that increase costs. You're getting less solar production or less energy production per acre, and there's higher structural costs. Um, but in Maine, there's no incentives, there's no separate dual use um, program. Um, and what we're seeing is sort of a, a floodgates have opened. Um, there's been a lot of uh, news around all of the projects that are going uh, on the ground in Maine over the next year or so. Next one, please, Chelsea. And so what you can see here on the left is a Maine Audubon map. Um, it's a really wonderful resource and I, I'll share the link once I'm done speaking, but you can actually look at uh, the solar projects on the ground. Um, and there's been a lot of news recently about this just incredible sort of land rush in Maine. Um, something that Massachusetts went through a little bit of growing pains as well. A lot of farmland was developed prior to the land use changes in the Massachusetts um, SMART program statute. So if we are thinking about trying to advance community solar, um, dual use solar in Connecticut, there's a way to think about it in terms of a very cautious metered um, manner, uh, you know, regardless of just farmland, but really of the whole process that 
really takes into consideration smart solar siting uh, principles, smart process principles, so that we don't have a mad rush and then a really significant pullback. Um, but instead, we're thinking about this smartly uh, and stepwise and working together to meet a common goal. Go ahead, Jess. And one last uh, sort of policy note is uh, there's been a lot of questions about current use, uh, you know, land classified as farmland, and how do you deal with something that uh, a land classified that wants to put a, a solar project? Um, well, in Rhode Island, uh, they actually allow projects as long as they are no more than 20% of the total acreage of the farm that's enrolled um, in the open space program, uh, farm forest open space program, excuse me. As long as it's no more than 20%, they can actually stay uh, classified as farmland. Um, in Maine and Massachusetts, there's been conversations and there's been you know, voiced support for finding some way, finding perhaps a pilot program that allows farmland to stay in its current use classification, um, even if there's a dual use project that's installed. Um, this actually can protect the farmland uh, upon decommissioning. It'll be enrolled in the program still. Um, it won't be removed from the program and then open for development uh, after decommissioning. And so there are some, some benefits potentially to a program like this that would have to be carefully discussed uh, in like a stakeholder group um, to determine if it's something that would work well. But it is something that other states around us are talking about. Go ahead, Chelsea. So I'm gonna wrap up with this and that's sort of how do we move forward? Um, and both Commissioner Dice and, and Chelsea have both mentioned this, that it's, it talk, it's talking about talking. We need to convene a stakeholder group, uh, get everybody at the table and, and get all of the, the, all of the players, right? The communities, the agricultural conservation organizations, the other organizations uh, in that manner and um, really get everyone at the table with policymakers to figure out how can we move this forward together. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna take a pause and I believe we're gonna do a little bit of Q&A. Uh, Emily, I have seen some questions in the chat. If you wanna start with um, some of the questions in the chat, I can read them to you if that would be helpful. Okay. so. Um, Sure. Uh, the first question is, has agrovoltaics been used for shade tobacco in the Connecticut River Valley? Of that so far, but that would be interesting since it already likes shade. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> the next question is, does the dust generated by typical farming activities impact the efficiency of solar panels in generating electricity. Oh, you're muted, Emily. I think you, there you go. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in understanding exactly how certain agricultural systems uh, integrate with solar. But um, what I do think is that, um, you know, the, the panels are not so high that they're not, um, cleanable and not reachable and plus regular uh, irrigation, regular rain precipitation as well would clean those off. Okay, great. And the next question is, solar is more efficient over cooler ground plant covered, which also helps with solar, soil health programs, pushing solar into marginal land that might be bird habitat is a real challenge. But these examples show it can increase viability of farms. Can you say again how fast the land is getting developed versus conserved in Connecticut? And Judy, to answer your question, um, according to AFT's Farms Under Threat report, we lost 23,000 acres of farmland between 2001 to 2016. Uh, last year, we calculated that we lost a little over 400 acres of farm fields, so that's not necessarily prime and important agricultural land uh, to solar development. And the Connecticut Department of Agriculture's Farmland Preservation Program protected over a thousand acres of farmland on 13 farms last year. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I can follow up with more uh, stats after today's webinar. 
And the next question is, has anyone studied the effects of shade on small streams and wetlands where the solar panels could provide some of the benefits of shade trees in open areas? Do solar panels tend to create vi viable shade habitats for animals and plants? You know, I'm not aware of any uh, of those shade studies. I do know that in Massachusetts, they're putting some arrays over cranberry bogs, um, and we'll be investigating that to look at those impacts. Yeah, and I've heard that in Maine, they're actually going to do some dual use solar over blueberries to see what the impacts are there. Uh, and then we have another question. Do you know of visual preference studies of elevated dual use solar with cows? I've read articles. They have been a tourist attraction. Um, I don't know about the, the sort of visual preference. I do know that that's an incredibly beneficial system to the cow. Uh, it can lower their heat stress uh, in, in high heat situations and it can actually lower their internal temperature by almost a degree. But in terms of the visual preference, I'm, I'm unsure. All right, and then Emily, I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned the Massachusetts SMART program, and I was wondering if you knew how Massachusetts developed the SMART program, um, and if it has truly incentivized more developers in Mass to put up dual use versus uh, the construction that you mentioned that destroys soil. I'm not completely familiar with the transition from SREX to the SMART program overall, but I do know that over the last couple of years with the um, dual use part, which is A ASTGU, Agricultural Solar Tariff Generation Units, um, they had proposed adjustments to the guidelines. Um, there were comments and due to the comments, they opened up some, some talking uh, sessions with and listening sessions with stakeholders in the community. Um, and after several of those, they went back and sort of reviewed the guidelines once more to put out a straw propo proposal for adjustments, uh, took a second round of comments. Um, and the conversations that have been happening have really been, I think, helpful in, in trying to work with the state um, to find systems and regulations and guidelines that work best for, for all interested parties. Um, and we're, you know, the last comment period uh, ended this past fall. And so we're awaiting to hear what, what might be next. Okay, great. And then we have one more question in the chat. Can you provide examples or process of improving water quality programs on existing farmland as part of construction for solar siting projects? Uh, Anecdotally, I can. I know that there's been uh, some projects that have installed bioswales uh, to improve um, runoff collection so they wouldn't enter the waterways, um, including like like you can actually see around, you know, other impervious surfaces like um, with really well designed parking lots and things like that. Um, some of those aspects have been put into place to um, support uh, water quality around the site and to try to minimize runoff. Okay, great. And those are all the questions in the chat. Does anyone else have questions for Emily or for me? Or I don't know if Commissioner Hurlbert is still on or Commissioner Dykes. Uh, any stormwater wetlands proposed for solar siting that you know of in Connecticut? Not that I know of, um, but I'm not, I, I'm not the, uh, the necessarily the expert on, on what's happening in that right now, but I'm unaware of any. Uh, Kip, are you aware of any? Rephrase the question again. What? It says, are any stormwater wetlands proposed for solar siting in Connecticut? Well, st stormwater management has, has been a very uh, significant issue on solar development projects. And because of that, um, Connecticut Deep has um, developed some new stormwater uh, permitting guidelines and uh, best management practices and, and review um, to help address those, to get those sites stabilized as quickly as possible. Um, and the uh, conservation districts have been, are, are involved in that process as well now, as far as review of 
plans and uh, on-site inspections. So again, as Emily pointed out, um, the in during the installation process is where there's the most potential for uh, significant erosion. Great. And then I think I saw Doug Pope. Did you have your hand up? Uh, yes. Uh, to respond to the previous question about um, we're very active in the in Massachusetts Smart Agricultural Solar Program and the incentive and the regulations. Uh, we, we have uh, four projects totaling almost 20 megawatts um, that uh, are working directly with the farmers. And uh, we're just waiting for the, uh, the, the guidelines to come out to, uh, to finalize and start. And Doug, who do you work for? Are you a... Uh, my name is Doug Pope from Pope Energy. It's my own firm. Oh, great. Maybe we can follow up with you after today's call to talk more about what you're doing in Massachusetts. Terrific. All right, well, we are almost at the 1.30 mark. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, Tim, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. And it's a great segue after the uh, installer just came on. What is the percentage increase in costs from a low ground mount to a high ground mount and percentage of lost um, generation on the spacing? Uh, developers would probably be better to, to answer the question around the cost. I do know that the six cent per kilowatt adder uh, really does seem to be uh, sufficient in incentivizing this more spaced out solar and the and overcoming the increased uh, cost of construction and working with the farmer. Um, as to the actual sort of numbers around construction, um, I don't have those. Okay, that's why I saw there was an installer that mentioned it just it was on just before I think his name was Doug. That's why I hit that target. And the follow up to that is, you know, I, we, we're talking farmland. And then after I saw the structures, uh, I know that there's in uh, Buckland Hills Mall, there's a solar structure on a parking lot. Why are we looking more in that direction? I know we're talking about farmland now. Why are we looking more in that? Because those are very, very high energy use buildings that typically have large parking lots. So just just came up with me. I saw these structures being used. Um, I didn't know the present the, the this presentation was going to go and talk about that. I'm glad this has all been brought up, but I was just almost wondering why we're not looking more to uh, you know parking lots and maybe uh, that further discussion down the road. I think we should be having those discussions. I think we should try to take advantage of of the built environment when we can and where it makes most sense. Um, <laughs> that's not my forte. I, I'm going to focus more on the, the ag side, but I think that's a wonderful idea and it's an opportunity to increase sort of other dual use type situations outside of, of agriculture. All right. Are there any other questions before we end today's webinar? I'm not seeing any, so uh, thank you all for coming this afternoon to today's webinar to learn more about dual use solar with us. And we will be in touch with some follow up materials, like I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I'll share the PowerPoint, a recording of the webinar, and uh, some of the materials that were mentioned. I'll also try to include a link to the Connecticut Deep Draft IRP report so that you can see where the solar siting stakeholder process is mentioned uh, that both Commissioner Dykes and Emily mentioned. Um, and we thank you for taking time on a Friday afternoon to, to join us to learn more about this topic. And like we said, we hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation and that there are many more to be had on this issue. Uh, so thank you and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you everybody for joining us.